a kind of strange background. I, I have a PhD in medieval literature, and um, how did I get from there to here? Um, I found medieval manuscript recipes. I was a medievalist, and I started cooking from them, and I wrote a book called To the King's Taste based on the recipes of Richard II, dated 1396. And I went on to write an Elizabethan cookbook, an 18th century cookbook, another book called Christmas Feast from History, tracing the celebration of Christmas from the Roman Saturnalia up through Dickens. Because there is actually, little did I know before I started, but there is a 4th century Roman cookbook. So um, at this time, this was in the 70s and early 80s, no one was doing food history. Now, people are doing food history, and it's a subject of academic inquiry, but at that time, it wasn't, which seemed to me bizarre. I mean, when you think that, you know, so much of the world was discovered as a, as a quest for spices, why this wasn't being taught in universities, it's, I, I, I could say something very sexist. But I'll say it instead. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so, um, what happened was I had I was teaching the history of gastronomy in, around different universities and <clears throat> excuse me. Um, by the time I finished my PhD, I pretty much decided I didn't want to be an academic. In addition to which, there were absolutely no jobs in 1979. There were no good. That was one of those dips. And uh, I would have had to go into a really small town someplace and then. You know, for a year, and then gone to another small place for a year, and it, it just it not it, in academia, and it just wasn't for me. So um, what happened was that <clears throat> my mother brought a pressure cooker back from India. My mother used to go on spiritual pilgrimages to India, and instead of bringing back a sari, she brought back a pressure cooker. <laughs> Why? Because she was a vegetarian as part of her spiritual practice, and she saw people in India using pressure cookers. And she had used one, as many people did, in the 40s. As a matter of fact, when I wrote my first book, Cooking Under Pressure, and it came out in 89, and when I first told my father that I was doing it, he said, you know, when you were born in 1945, People came over to the house to meet you, and you know we, we really we had no food ready, so we threw a chicken in the pressure cooker, and we made a chicken stew. So it was kind of a fun kind of thing the way it happened because I don't really remember my mom using a pressure cooker when I was growing up uh, because I think what happened was in the fifties you started having fast food, you started having frozen food, TV dinners. I mean I remember eating TV dinners when I was a kid, even though my mom was a very good cook. I used to love the, the TV dinner with that fried chicken portion and you know, the other, the, the mashed potato portion is all divided into, you know, sections. So I'm sure she bought it for me, not because she thought it was great food, but that's what I must have requested. But, but I think, you know, she stopped using the pressure cooker because it just kind of died out and then you found it at yard sales uh, or whatever. And uh, so anyway, she... She came back from India with this really junky pressure cooker, the kind like a pre presto now makes the reasonably good ones. <coughs> and the old prestos were really very good too, but you know, she brought back that kind of cooker that goes jugga, 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 jugga on top, that the pressure regulator jiggled around. And anyway, I'd go there, I'd say, Ma, this is a great chickpea stew, and she'd say 20 minutes, you know, and then it was a great lentil soup, and she'd say seven minutes, and I'm thinking, you know, what is going on? Everyone says they don't have enough time to cook. Why isn't everybody using a pressure cooker? It's just, you know, a light bulb went off in my head. So, um, and of course, I had absolutely no idea at this time that people were afraid of pressure cookers, because my mother wasn't. So I happened to be talking to a New York editor one day. I was somewhat known in publishing because of these unusual historical cookbooks that had come out. I was talking to an editor, and she said, what are you up to lately? And I said, well, my, you know, my mom brought this pressure cooker back from India, and I'm really impressed with pressure cooking. She said, you're on. So without even writing a proposal or anything, without even using a pressure cooker myself, <laughs> I got this contract to write this book, and Cooking Under Pressure, which is coming out, the 20th anniversary edition is coming out 
in November. And it was sold really, really well. But as I went around the country, uh, I realized that many people are terrified of the pressure cooker. I heard every story about, you know, Antilles pea soup on the ceiling and ground tomatoes. <laughs> and it, yeah, I mean, everybody has <laughs> their version, and I heard them all, you know. And I um, fear is something that I began to realize. It, it just, it's deeply emotional, and if people are afraid, there's no kind of logic to like getting them over it, except possibly to, to see the pressure cooker demonstrated. Mind you, the people who had accidents with the pressure cooker, it was their fault, because the cardinal rule, well, here's how pressure cooking works. You, you, you have a lid which has a gasket, so that when you lock the lid in place, which you do by aligning it in a certain way so that it nests, you see it nesting? You'll see that, how it drops down. And then you lock it by aligning the handles. Each, uh, each pressure cooker brand is a little bit different in how it locks. So if you want at the end, I can give you some recommendations of which ones to buy. But in any case, um, the, okay, so water normally boils at 212 degrees, but in the pressure cooker, in this, vacuum that's created once the pressure is built because in its steam pressure you only fill the pressure either one pressure cooker either one half or two thirds full because you've always got to allow a few inches for the steam pressure to build. So you're cooking food at 242 degrees instead of 212. So at that hard and normal boiling point, food cooks in one third or less the standard cooking time. So you get split pea soup. If you, if you cook it for 10 minutes and then just let the pressure come down naturally, which I'll explain, it's literally pureed when you open the pot. Pot roast, fork tender in an hour. Um, I have recipes in Pressure Perfect where I do this thing called uh, triplex cooking, and I put the potatoes on the bottom. Pressure cookers come with a steaming basket. I forgot mine at home. So I didn't bring it, but it's a, it's a steaming basket that sits in the cooker. You can put a meatloaf in that, uh, form it right in the steaming basket, set, set that meatloaf on top of the potatoes, then wrap some carrots in tin foil, which will retard the cooking so that they don't get too soft. And you have the whole meal in, in I think it's five minutes. <laughs> it's either five or ten, I can't remember. Top of my book. So, um, it's an incredible way to cook. Um, some people who are real connoisseurs say to me, if you, and you make asso buco in the pressure cooker in 25 minutes instead of slow braising in an hour and a half to two hours. So some people will say, who are really into slow braising, is it is good. And I never personally was into slow braising because I'm a hurry up cook. I have no patience. I have no patience, which is why pressure cooking is just the right kind of cooking for me. I'm not a slow cooker type of person. I never even tried one. I had one in my house for a year and I never tried it once because it's just not my personality. I'm impatient. So I really personally couldn't say if the taste and the texture were the same. But people who do slow braising say that it's not quite as succulent. So, my 